I'm going to talk about how to solve linear equations. Now I found these five steps will pretty much take care of solving almost all the linear equations you're going to run into. You need to get rid of grouping symbols. You need to be able to combine like terms on one side and then put your variables on a single side of the equation and your constants on the other side. And from there you're looking at a two-step equation where you need to add or subtract or multiply or divide anything to get your variable all by itself. Let's go ahead and look at example number one. If we have a 6y plus 21 plus 7 equals a 4y minus 20 plus 5y, the first thing that I always check for is that I get rid of all my grouping symbols. Because this equation doesn't have one, I don't need to worry about it. And when we go to combine like terms, we've got two constants on the left side, so we'll need to combine those and we get a 6y plus a 28. And on the right side, we have two variable terms. So 4y plus 5y is going to give me 9y minus 20. From there, we need to make sure that the variables on one side of the equation. Some people like to always move variables to the left side. I personally like to move the smallest variable so that I don't have to worry about negatives a whole lot. So if I move the 6y to the right side of the equation, I'm going to need to subtract 6y, not 9, 6. What I'm left with is a 28 equaling a 3y minus 20. Now that I've moved my variables to the right side, I need to move my constant terms to the left. So I'm going to add 20 to both sides. Because if it's negative on the right, it needs to be positive on the left. Now these 20s are going to reduce, and what I have is a 48 equals a 3y. Leaving my last step to get rid of the 3, which is being multiplied. So I'm going to divide it to make that cancel. 48 divided by 3 is 16. So I get the answer of 16 equals y which is a perfectly acceptable answer. Although most people have decided that it really does look better if we have the variable first, so you're going to typically see that written as a y equals 16. Let's go ahead and look at the next example. Number two, we have three times a quantity of w plus 7 minus 5w equals w plus 10. Now this time we do have grouping symbols to deal with, so we're going to need to get rid of those. Whenever you have this number in front of the parenthesis, you're going to need to distribute the 3 to the w and the 7 by multiplying. So we end up with a 3w plus 21 minus a 5w, and that's going to equal your w plus 10. Now we need to combine like terms. This 3w needs to be combined with the negative 5w, and since positive 3 minus 5 gives me negative 2w, plus 21 equals a w plus 10, because there's nothing to combine, and then we're on to our next step. Now this negative 2w is definitely smaller than the positive 1w. And you got to remember, if you're trying to combine these terms, there is an invisible 1 in front of here. If I have a negative 2w on the left, to move it, I'm going to need a positive 2w on the right. This leaves me with a 21 equaling 3w's plus 10. Now that we've taken care of that, we can add or subtract. We need to move the 10 over with the 21, so I'm going to subtract 10. I get 11 equals 3w. Divide by 3. And I get w equals 11 thirds. Now this is an improper fraction, and depending on what math class you're in, you might want to leave this answer in different forms. Now you can turn it into a proper fraction, but once you get to the Algebra 2 level, we really do prefer just fractions with tops and bottoms. So we're going to leave this as a y, w equaling 11 over 3. Alright, now to the next example. 
Number three, we have a one-fourth times a quantity of 3x minus 8. And that's going to equal 2. Now we do need to get rid of the grouping symbols. But if we did what we did in example two and just tried to distribute this one-fourth to the three and the eight, mathematically it works perfect. But then we're going to have a th fraction in two of the terms. An easier way to do this would be to remember that this parentheses whole job is to tell you that it needs to be multiplied times this one-fourth. And this one-fourth is saying one divide by four. So if I want to undo dividing by something, I can also just multiply it times 4. Now, as long as I do that to the other side of the equation, I'm allowed to. Now, if I multiply 1 fourth times a 4, those both go away and they become the number 1. Then I don't need my parentheses because I've got nothing to multiply by anymore. So the only thing I have here is the 3x minus 8. And since I multiplied the 4, pretty much went to the other side of the equation. And so 2 times 4 gives me 8 here. Now, we took care of grouping symbols. There are no terms to combine. And my variables are on one side of the equation. So now I just need to move the 8. And if it's negative on the left, it's going to be positive on the right. So I have a 3x equaling 16. Then you're going to divide by 3 and we get x equals 16 thirds. Let's look at another example. Now this one has fractions again. We have a 1 third x plus a 3 fourths, and that equals a 2x plus a 1 third. And we don't have any grouping symbols here, but we have some really achy numbers that you might not want to deal with. So I'm going to use kind of a trick to go ahead and get rid of these fractions. And the last example, I had a 1 over 4, and I needed to get rid of that 4, which was at the bottom of my fraction. And so I multiplied it by a number at the top that I could reduce with. I'm going to do the same thing here. The only thing is, is I cannot reduce a 3 and a 4 with the same number. So you're going to want to find the smallest number you can reduce a 3 and a 4 with. And the easiest way to do that is, remember, 3 times 4 can gives me a 12, which means I can have a 4 and a 3 reduce with this exact same number. And just like the other example, when I do multiply something times the fraction, I've got to do it to both sides. I also have to do it to all the terms on both sides. So we're going to use these big pink brackets to remind us that we need to multiply this 12 times every term in the fraction. Now, when you multiply a 12 over 1 times a 1 over 3, the 3 will reduce and become a 1. And this 12 reduces, this becomes a 4. So I take 4 times my 1x, and I end up with a 4x. Now, we're going to distribute the 12 to the next fraction. If we have a 12 at the top, it's going to reduce with this 4 at the bottom, and leave me with a 3. From there, you have 3 times 3, so we have a new term of 9. Then you move the fraction to the next term. Now, because 2x doesn't have anything at the bottom of it, all I can do is multiply 12 times 2x, and that gives me a 24x. Then when you distribute the 12 to the last term, we have a 3 in the denominator, so we can reduce it. So that leaves me with a 4 times 1 over 1 times 1. So my final term becomes 4. Now from here, we've got a much easier equation. We can combine like terms on either side. And now all we have to do is move one of my variable terms. Now if I have a positive 4x, I'm going to move it by making it a negative 4x. And I chose to move it just because it's the smallest variable. I'm left with 9 equals a 20x plus 4. Then when I move the positive 4 to the other side, I need to subtract. And I'm left with 5 equals 20x. And here you have to be careful. 20 in divided by 5 is definitely 4. But if you write a 4 as the answer, 
I hope you realize why you're going to get it wrong. This is the biggest mistake that my students make when they're going too fast. This becomes a one-fourth, not a four. And it sounds like a silly mistake, but I see it all the time. So just be careful. All right. Now our last two examples are a little different. They're special kinds of equations. Just like in regular life, not all equations work out to have nice numbers. There are two kinds that we typically refer to as an all-real number or no-solutions equation. Now this first one we call an identity. And here's why it's called an identity. When we go to solve this equation like we normally do, we check for grouping symbols, and then we're going to combine terms, and that 3 and 4x would become a 7x plus 5, and it's got to equal a 7x plus 5. Now as we try to move variables to the same side of the equation, if I chose to move my right side to my left side, I would have to make that positive 7 and negative 7x in order to get the right side to cancel. But in this equation, the left side cancels too, which means all of the variables are gone and the only thing I have left is a 5 equals 5. Now, this is a true statement. Whenever you get a true statement, you have what's called an identity. Now, it doesn't matter where you recognize a true statement. You might have noticed over here that 7x plus 5 equaled 7x plus 5, which was also a true statement. Now, the second time you've found that out, the answer is technically all real numbers. That means that I could pick any possible number to plug in my, for my variable of x and I would always get two statements that were exactly equal. Now in this class you're going to be able to write that as just the all real numbers symbol. Now sometimes we have equations that always work and then we have what's called a contradiction. And these are equations that never work. Now again, if we start following our normal steps and I try to get rid of my grouping symbol, I'm going to need to distribute that 8 to the y and the 7. So I get an 8y plus a 56 equals, and while I'm rewriting, I'm going to go ahead and combine the 6y and 2y, so I get an 8y minus 8. When we go to move our y's to the same side of the equation, I need I can make that write y negative, and we're going to subtract 8y to both sides. And once again, the variables go away, but this time, what I'm left with is a 56 equals a negative 8. This is not a true statement. When you see something that can never happen, or you get a false statement, we have what's called no solution. This means that there's absolutely nothing I could ever plug into an equation that would make 56 equal a negative 8. So we would write the no solution symbol as an answer. I hope this helped solving equations. I'm sure you'll have plenty of new questions to ask your teacher when you get to class.